So welcome everyone. Um, welcome to the Casus Institute seminar today. Um, it's a pleasure today to have um, Hernandez Acosta, um, who will present his research today. Um, so Uwe um, is in the department meta indexing conditions. He has been at Casus since the summer of 2020. I think so, yes. yes. Right. At least it's on contract, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but he has been at HCTR, HCTR and Dresden already for some time. So he studied physics in Dresden and he did his PhD also at the Technical University of Dresden. And his dissertation topic was pulse perturb perturbative QED. And um, following that, he continued working at HCTR. He joined Casus. And he will talk about his research uh, um, to us today. Um, and yeah, I will hand over to Uwe. Yeah. And I'm very excited and curious about your talk. Okay, thank, thank you very much for the, for the nice introduction. Uh, I need to say it's, a, it's, it's part of the research I do, uh, which is uh, especially European ECFL focused. So just, just, just to as a, a quick disclaimer. Uh, so welcome everyone. Um, my, my first, uh, we, we actually uh, say this was the first institute seminar talk I give uh, for, for Casus in, in this around about three years. I, I'm here now. Um, yes, and, and the topic you can read it it's uh, first principle descriptions of QD processes in X ray laser fields, it's like a general overall topic. Um, and then the strong field prospect at the European XFL is a, is a more specialized one. But I need to disclaim that the strong field part, you will see what, what, what happens with the strong field part. And I, actually would replace it uh, with event generation and why I will tell you in the, in the talk. Um, first of all, just what I want to talk in the next couple of minutes is uh, I, just wanna, I just want to give a quick motivation uh, on the European XFL as a machine and why it's so interesting uh, doing some, some science with that. Then I will introduce you in like this first principle description, what it means, what is our model, what we or me as a person contributed to that and uh, how we proceed with uh, this contribution. And then I go a bit more into event, uh, event generation um, using the models uh, or using the description, part of description uh, uh, I, uh, yeah, I developed. Um, okay, to start with the motivation. First of all, what is the physics use case in general for my part of research? Uh, it is usually like a, a collision of, of lasers in general but in, uh, especially uh, uh, X-ray lasers with sort of scattering partners, if they are electron beams or photons, or maybe in the future also ions and uh, plasmas. And in this collision, uh, some particles are scattered, produced, and so on, and uh, they are scattered in, in some solid angle uh, uh, in, in space, um, and they, these particles have a certain energy. And what I want to do is I want to predict um, yeah, how many particles will be detected in such a solid angle there. Um, and the thing is why, why it's so interesting to do that is just on a, on a phenomenological side, we expect certain phenomena to be present there. For instance, depending on the properties of the laser, multi-photon scattering effects. So simultaneously, a lot of photons scatter with one particle. Uh, you can have yeah, really strong non-perturbative effects where you can't do like these uh, expansions to a small parameter. And some other guys uh, know what I mean and, and they say no. Um, depending on the intensity, uh, you can have something like unstable vacuum effects where electron positron pairs pop out of the vacuum uh, and be present there due to the presence of a laser. So it's not that, that they just annihilate immediately again. And on top of that, you can have like electromagnetic cascades where a single particle can produce like tens or hundreds of thousands of particles depending on the conditions. And um, this is like a more academic uh, way to say it's nice to do these things but actually this thing has uh, yeah real applications in a way for instance when you go yeah to the sky to the to space uh, and uh, look at special kinds of stars called magnetars which are neutron stars uh, with which are famous for having like really strong magnetic fields and in order to understand like the magnetosphere of such stars, it's really important to interpret like data coming from, from there, which uh, um, is like the, um, the light produced when this magnetic field interacts with the nebula around the stars and so on. And then actually to, to understand this interaction, we need to understand how strong fields interact with charged particles. So like the theory I, I developed here. 
Um, for instance, in, in uh, high luminosity uh, um, electron positron colliders, which are like tools from particle physics to have like precise measurements of some elementary particle properties. Um, there, due to the high luminosity, which means like a lot of charged particles are packed uh, in, in, in a bunch, the particles feel the field of the other particles, which means you have these uh, like non perturbative effects you also see in strong QED. Um, on the other way, uh, on the other side, like not going to this particle physics stuff, but going more to the like condensed matter stuff, there are actually some materials with really interesting properties that on the surface of these materials, so the direct and wire semi-metals, uh, there are quasi-particles which act like strongly coupled direct particles, so electrons in the end. Um, and to, to, to describe these, the dynamics of these particles on the surface, you can, uh, you can also use like a similar theory than a strong field QED uh, used for the laser powders. And in the end, is graphene one of the? Yes, yes, graphene is one of them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and in the end, like the one which is, yeah, I worked on uh, like for a couple of years, uh, uh, near to that, not directly, but near to that, is uh, relativistic plasma physics. So when you produce plasmas with optical lasers, all the dynamics in there is uh, involved in strong field effects. Okay, um, but this is just like general overview about the physics use case and why in general we should do that. And now we come to a particular our machine or the machine I want to do some science for. Um, and this is the European XFAL. It's a it's a huge laser, I need to say, because the free electron in the name of the, of the laser uh, is actually a, a, the driving force to produce the laser light because it's using uh, an electron beam. But we don't use the electrons, or not directly. There are experiments using the electrons, but we are interested in the laser light coming from these free electrons. How they laser and so on, this is like a bit complicated. I don't, don't excuse me, I don't want to go into detail with that, but uh, it produces the light. So the light is the important part. And um, just to show you, for those who are not familiar with lasers, what is what are the properties uh, to, we use to describe such a lasers? Uh, depend on who you ask. Uh, and if you ask an experimentalist, for instance, they have something like the peak intensity, uh, they have something like the reference rays length, uh, reference in, in this case that the free tone, uh, the XFL is a pulse laser, so it's a laser pulse, so the wavelength change over time, but you have some, most of the time something like a, like a central wavelength uh, you can define. Um, this can be translated to frequency, but sure, everyone knows that. Uh, and then you have, since it's a pulse, a pulse duration in time, which is usually like femtoseconds or so. Uh, and we translate that to a so-called pulse width, which translates that to, to like the, the, the base domain of the field. This actually is just uh, done because of Lorentz invariance, because what we want to do is relativistic. And if you want to do relativistic, it is better to describe it in, in uh, yeah, Lorentz invariant quantities. And with this, I come to the uh, A naught, which is a really important pa parameter. It's the classical nonlinearity parameter. It has actually a definition, uh, which is seen in this formula here. But in the end, you can translate that uh, into the quantities actually used from the experimentalists, like intensity and uh, central frequency. Um, and this parameter A naught is something like a, like an order parameter to the kind of, of, of interaction you have here. For instance, if A0 is small, you can do up to a certain extent perturbative uh, expansions involving a, a spectra, uh, but involving spectra. I will show you this in, in a moment. But when A0 is bigger than one, then you have like changed the physics in a way that uh, it becomes like highly non perturbative and you need to, to use other techniques. But I will show you in a moment. Okay. Um, the question is when I, when I showed you these parameters, but what is actually, I mean, we need to put some numbers on. Um, and on the left-hand side, I, I borrowed a, a plot where the A naught, this classic non-interity parameter, uh, and the frequency uh, and the, the wavelength are, are shown. And just to, to give you some some like hints where, where we are uh, in the end, um, the wavelength, the, the shorter the wavelength, the, the, the higher the energy of the laser is, and the bigger the A naught, uh, the bigger the intensity. But these two, there's an interplay between them. So there's, I don't want to go into detail with this plot, just showing you there are a lot of effects. However, if you look at the numbers of the uh, XFAL, like 40 keV of an omega, uh, omega X and the intensity of 10 to 21, you can actually calculate A0, see A0 is really small, uh, and the wavelength at the end is really, uh, really small, uh, too, which means we are here in this small corner. 
maybe near to one, depending on who you ask. So, so maybe in this corner. So in, in this corner, we have like, like some special properties uh, of the European XFAL, uh, for instance, that is so-called decoherency assumption breaks. And this actually means that um, when a particle interacts with the European XFAL, it sees like several cycles of the pulse. It does not see like the field as a, as a, as a constant bump, but it sees it like, like it, it gathers the energy through a lot of cycles. Um, and this can be modeled, or this can uh, uh, this can be modeled by using higher order processes. Which I'll show you in, in part two, um, and with a sort of uh, spectral extent. So you don't have like a constant field, but you have a, a more or less monochromatic field which has some kind of spectrum on it. Um, the almost monochromatic part, just for the for the laser guys uh, 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 among among us. Um, the care value of, of the European XFL, especially in the upgrade uh, version, uh, is, is, is 1.5 to 9, which means uh, it is, there is a probability that higher harmonics will be generated, which means even higher energy. So this is like the, the, the important part. And with energy, I, I all the time mean central frequency uh, times the, the, the Planck constant. So it, I don't mean the full pulse energy, I mean this the, like the frequency of the and then one special thing compared to optical lasers uh, is the high repetition rate. So um, what intro train uh, the, the, the European XFL can do is like giving megahertz of pulses. So millions, million pulses per second. And this is like a really important part for everything which follows here because this may introduce a lot of statistics because you can measure quite a lot compared to optical lasers which have, I don't know, one hertz or maybe 10 hertz at max. Uh, these things are megahertz, so, so you can gather a lot of data. And this actually influences the kind of description, the conceptual uh, uh, the, the description of the whole thing. Okay, this was part one, just showing you the, the XFAL, so how it looks like, where, what, what is expected from the properties uh, of, of kind of the interactions and so on. And what I now want to introduce to you is like going a bit deeper in there. So, so it's showing you what is expected on the level of elementary particles uh, when they interact with the European XFL. And I, most of the time, phrase this in a way that I say the European XFL is used in this kind of thing as a driver, which means not like on its matter uh, or in, in other fields where they use the European XFL as a probe, so just for imaging, just for imaging. Uh, but here I use it directly to do physics with it. So this is like the, the, the complementary part uh, to, to the one that's uh, side. And again, the same picture again, we collide the European XFL with say an electron beam or photon beam, and we want to figure out what is getting. Okay, starting with that, what can we expect? Um, first of all, I need to say we need kind of new tools. And the reason why um, I start on that on the left-hand side, most of the people would say, okay, when I have charged particles and I interact them with, uh, with a laser field, just do Thompson scattering. Everyone does Thompson scattering, maybe X-ray Thompson scattering. But the thing is, what I plotted here is the total cross section of uh, Thompson scattering, which is the QED, like general QED form of Thompson scattering, uh, and normalize it to Thompson scattering as a function uh, of the uh, yeah, laser energy or laser frequency, I would say, laser frequency. And as you see in the optical regime, which is here in green, uh, which is here in green, you see that uh, this is better. Here you see it. Uh, uh, maybe in green, uh, you see that uh, Compton and Thompson are mostly interchangeable. And this is clear because Thompson is the lower energy limit of Compton scattering. However, if you go to XFL energies, like uh, if XFL frequencies, like 1 to 50 keV, depending uh, on, yeah, maybe upgrade, but uh, then you see it starts with like Thompson overestimates Compton by 2, 3%. But when we go to the upgrade, like the 50 kV uh, European XFL with, with in the future, maybe, then you see that it, it, it rather quickly starts to highly overestimate uh, uh, scattering. So highly overestimate the real scattering uh, signal. And this can be an issue, depending on how precise your experiment uh, should be, can be an issue that you don't describe it like right, because you overestimate it with uh, scattering. On the other hand, other people do when you say, okay, I involve laser fields, they do a, a thing is, which is called locally constant field approximation. It means, in the end, putting it in a pick code or something like that, but they, they, they have the interaction localized and they assume that in a localized box, the field of the laser is rather constant. And then they. In space. In, in space. Uh, in space and yeah, in, in space per, yeah, in space per time step. Yeah, okay, that's right. But in space. Uh, 
actually in, 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 the, in the phase domain, but it doesn't matter. In space, same space. Um, and the, the thing is, um, there is like a like a quantity, I not square m square over uh, p times k, uh, which quantifies not directly, but uh, which, which gives you a hint if this uh, kind of approximation is valid. And when this uh, when this quantity is is what a large, like say a hundred and more, then you can apply uh, a local constant field approximation. If it's lower than that, then you can't apply it. And what I showed here is this quantity against the uh, collided electron energy. So I collide electron beam with the X-fell, um, and, uh, the X uh, and then for different x -fell frequencies, I uh, just put it the lines in there as a function of the electron energy. So. Can, can I ask here? Yeah. Um, so you cannot, so what, what does break if you, so what do you break if you, um, so in a certain let's say I'm asking um, this constant approximation of the field. How do I see it, or what is the? I don't quite understand why. What the reasoning is why it breaks here in terms of this quantity, or can you explain it in terms? Uh, of it's, yeah, yeah, this is uh, actually a bit under consideration at some point uh, if this quantity is a white quantity and it's also not a quantity where you can like directly say okay if it's that and that because it's actually highly dependent on the kinematics of the process however it gives you a good hint if it's it's, if it's working or not in the end um it is like uh, coming together with the decoherency assumption break breakdown what i said uh, uh, in, in the two slides before uh, because when you when you when the field is highly highly oscillating because the frequency is so high then the process or the the particles during the process, uh, one want to scatter it over the laser. Um, they see not like a constant field, uh, uh, but they see a lot of oscillations in their like formation length or in their interaction region. I would say so. And this can be sort of quantified with this quantity, saying okay, how much, how big is the is the, is the interaction volumina of the process compared to the wavelength. I see. Volumina are given by the wavelength. I mean, more like when I'm thinking more of yeah. material science. Yeah. There you would have a characteristic separation of atoms. Yes, yes. And then something like, yeah. But if, if it's an X ray, for example, the wavelength falls in between. And that's right. That's right. That's kind of what I kind of, This is kind of the, the similar thing. Uh, here, here it is. It does, it does just say, okay, if, if, the, if the length scale of, of the process to be happen, with a certain probability or with a high probability, uh, uh, is is smaller than the uh, smaller than the wavelength, then the, the the process itself does not see like the whole oscillation. But here it's vice versa. So the, the wavelength is so short that the uh, actual actual formation length of the process sees a lot of cycles, and that's why we can't uh, use these these local approximation anymore. Um, and this is actually what's shown here. So you see see for different uh, frequencies and when you go with the optical frequency, like 1 kV and, and, and lower, you're in this band of, I can apply local constant field approximations, but when you go to kEV and even 50 kV and so on, this blue band here, you see that uh, it's completely outside of it. So it's like uh, going beyond one and so on. So it means clearly it gathers a lot of energy uh, from a lot of cycles and not uh, and, and can, can't be assumed as, as constant anymore. And this is actually also one of the reasons why you can't involve this type of process I will show you in a, in a couple of slides um, into PIC codes because in PIC codes you need to assume a certain like um, local constant field to make the process happen and in a way there are concepts beyond that but uh, I don't want to talk about that today um, okay but what I need to say is just this shows that you can't use like these standard laser tools you want to use all the time so this is the, 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 the conclusion of this slide. You need more like a QED-like description. This is like the, the summary of this slide. Um, okay, and with that, I come to the thing where I recently published the paper, or uh, submitted the paper, <laughs> not published, but I submitted the paper, uh, prepared this out, um, just, uh, with, together with my, my PhD supervisor. Um, and this is what, like a reformulation of strong field QED uh, fully in momentum space. And the reason why I show you that is because afterwards there will be a lot of diagrams involving this, this kind of vertex. You don't need to understand uh, all the formulas. And so it's just showing you that 
In order to describe the thing, what we do is we take the description of standard QED given by this, by this vertex here with a small uh, black dot, and we translate that to a thing that's called the dressed vertex. Dressed vertex can be seen as the interaction happens within a laser field, within the X-file field in our, in our case. Uh, so it means the shaded blob here involves all the dependencies on the field. So, uh, and this, uh, and energetically, this is um, parameterized by the so-called photo number parameter, which is this L here. Uh, this L is like an important parameter, it's an, an, an Lorentz and Ryan parameter, which is good. Um, and if you look at the, at the uh, like balancing equation of this, of this delta distribution here, you see that it actually uh, is involved in the uh, energy momentum conservation involving the, back, uh, the background field. So it models actually how many of, uh, of the reference momenta from the background field is involved in the process at this vertex. vertex. And what is shown here is just like how the vertex is shaped. So what is the actual rule to, to put into calculations with that? Um, and the most important things are the so-called phase integrals because they are the only uh, integrals which involve the uh, background field, which is AMU. Um, and as you see, it's like a Fourier integral, but with another oscillator, it uh, means you have a lot of effects involved in there if you have general AMUs. General in a way. Okay. Um, but the thing is, I showed you in the beginning that the Euclid XFL has some, some special properties. And uh, these properties will come in handy evaluating this one. And in order to show that, I start with compound scattering. Compound scattering is like the the yeah, Trisopola Melanogaster of uh, these types of, of, of uh, theories. Uh, what you do actually is you shoot in, in a single electron uh, into a laser field and it just radiates a, a photon and a recall, uh, has a recall electron. Uh, and you can describe it like using just this one vertex here. Um, this actually is not allowed in standard QD because it violates uh, energy moment of conservation. But as I showed you, uh, due to the balancing equation involving the background field, this thing can happen. And there is a lot of things, uh, 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 there were a lot of things done in the last uh, 50 years about this very process in strong fields. However, what we uh, looked at just to use it as a, as a tool is uh, we looked at the small a naught uh, uh, contribution of this very process. Because maybe you remember the open SFL as an a naught of yeah, 10 to the minus 3. Which means it is reasonable to, ex, uh, to, to, to expand the whole theory in a way to um, in a naught and keep the lowest order for, for now. We're also working on higher order uh, contributions in a naught, but for now, just the lowest order. And this lowest order is what we call pulse productive QED. And this is what was the title of my PhD thesis. And I worked on that in my PhD thesis for. Uh, Can you repeat? How is it, How is it called? Uh, pulse productive QED. And the reason why we call it like this is it is perturbative QED, like we know it. However, it involves pulse structure. It involves spectrum of the field. And this is the most important part. And for the lowest order, it's kind of obvious what the spectral uh, look like. It's a form factor which involves the Fourier transformed field. And this is what you see here. When you use this Compton process, go to the lowest order and A naught, then you see like standard Compton process. Standard diagrams of Compton process of uh, scattering of photons and electrons, but the input uh, uh, form momentum of the photon coming in is parameterized by the photon number parameter, and the distribution of the photon number parameter is given by the Fourier transform. So this is actually what you expect from, for instance, columns, columns scattering or something like that. Your column field, uh, you would couple, couple it in this very same way as, as this one. Um, and most importantly, uh, for field models, given you can uh, calculate this more or less analytically, which means you can like fastly evaluate for something like complex scattering with that. And this is what is shown here. Uh, this is the, the differential cross section of uh, strong field Compton scattering in a small A0 approximation, so pulse perturbative Compton, uh, which is normalized that on this black dashed line, it is equal to the standard perturbative. Part, so the Kleinishina formula, known since ages. Um, and what you see here is on the, on the line itself, it's one, it's normalized like that. But even like off this line, you see the signal. You see that there are contributions to the whole process, uh, which are like comparable to, to, to the one uh, on, on the line. The line itself is an important part because what you see here is two-dimensional. 
It depends on the energy of the scattered photon and the scattering angle. And usually when you go come scattering in a, in, a, in, a, in a textbook, you see uh, like there is a formula between these two. It's called the Koppen formula. However, since we have an additional degree of freedom with the photon number parameter, our process starts becoming two-dimensional um, and, and fulfilling the whole phase space uh, with that one. The black dashed line here uh, is the formula. So it's, it's uh, like the so-called Kaneshina line. And as you see, the, uh, like the impact of the spectrum is like just line drawn. To very reasonable. Okay. Um, another process which we can model with that, or what was modeled like since ages, uh, is, is the bright wheeler process. And the reason why I show you that is the problem with Compton scattering in an experimental setup is um, when you scatter electrons with a laser, you usually uh, yeah, have a lot of laser photons and a lot of electrons around. That means when you produce electrons and photons, it's hard to distinguish them. You can do it kinematically at, at some point, but in a way, it, this is like an, an, an experimental problem that you, you, you have like producing electrons and photons with. Um, and the Bravilla process is sort of different uh, because you shoot a photon into your laser field, like uh, K-gamma, K highly energetic most of the time, uh, and you produce an electron-positron pair. And due to this positron, uh, you can actually easily detect because you can't you, you can distinguish the positron more easily from the electrons just putting a magnet on it and look at the, the, the uh, trajectories. Um, I need to say easy because an experimentalist would say, okay, it's even hard, but it's not that hard. Like <laughs> so, this is like the 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 the, uh, um, the thing here. And however, just using bright wheeler in this way is also hard to do. Um, because it is a threshold process, and the threshold process means you need a certain energy in the incoming, uh, in, the, in the center of momentum, so the incoming particles, that this process actually will happen. And um, this is what they actually see on this uh, little plot here. It is the center of, uh, of momentum energy. So when I go in the center of momentum, where both momentum cancel each other, uh, and uh, look at the energy of, of, of the whole system, um, here it plotted dependent to the energy of the uh, of the um, incoming photon of the uh, incident photon uh, for different frequencies of the laser again. And as you see for optical lasers like one EV lasers, uh, it is almost the most of the energy of near, near uh, all of the energy needs to come from uh, from the um, from the uh, in, um, from the K, K gamma. But however, even if I go to fifty keV, this is this yellow line here. I also need mostly the energy from the uh, from the K, K gamma, and even if I not couple just one but up to ten photons, there's nothing not not much changing on the on the on the threshold side. So it means you need at least two hundred keV photons to ignite the process. Uh, and finding two hundred uh, keV photons in a stable and controlled way is really really hard. Uh, in optical setups, they did something like this in the seminal experiment at Slack in the late 90s. And there are upcoming experiments at Luxie, at, uh, uh, Luxie at DAISY, and uh, also at Slack, the E320. Um, but till now, there is no direct observation of that. So there are some indirect ones, some claims from, from uh, LHC, for instance, or other Hadron colliders that they saw something like that, but no direct one. The way you control the photon source and do by reload with the laser. This is never uh, has never been seen. Yeah. Of curiosity. So how do they produce these high energy K gammas? Is it synchrotron radiation? Uh, no, no, it's uh, it is uh, uh cotton back scattering most of the time. Okay. And I uh, th this is actually the thing with these uh, uh seminal experiment, uh since they, they what they used actually as a as a, as a optical laser with a with a high energetic electron beam. It produces highly energetic uh, uh, backscattered photons, and they interact with the same laser, same optical laser. And uh, since the laser intensity was rather low, um, they had I don't know 80 candidates for events for positrons, and roughly 20 or so uh, like verified events. And this is not the observation, so it count, does not count as an observation, but it gives a good hint that it's possible. Uh, and Luxi and and E320 uh, want to want to uh, fill this gap in a way. As one of their of their uh, things. Um, yes, and now the point is. Thank you for this question because this this <laughs> brings me uh, to to my my favorite process, uh, which is the trident process. Um, the reason why this is my 
all the steps. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is this experiment? So I know the old slug experiment. Is this facet? This is also facet is just another. Uh, it's a, it's a, yeah. and also it's like so it's also like yeah. Yes, and uh, Laxia Daisy is in a tunnel of the European XFL, but not using the European XFL, but using the electron beam from the European XFL against an optical. Light. But it's not built now, so it's just uh, designed and, and, and I don't know the, the actual state now, but yeah. What, what shall be the energy of the electron beam? The electron beam is like uh, 70, 17 uh, GeV is, uh, I think, the, the electron energy. And for the Slack experiment, it was roughly 50. Uh, GV, actually. Okay, but now, now come over to the Trident process, uh, which was also like the process I, I uh, uh, did, well, yeah, worked on uh, in the PhD thesis, in my PhD thesis. Uh, in, and the thing is, as Attila asked the question, uh, the source of these high, highly energetic photons uh, are usually, is usually complex scattering, because there you can get like these really high energies and they are model, uh, they are gathered uh, the, the energy from the electron beam, which is good. Because Accelerating electrons is a bit easier than photons. Um, however, if you do this in a like naive way, just saying complex scattering and then uh, producing uh, with, the, with the photon producing electron positron pairs by Bright Wheeler, uh, you will end up uh, seeing that there are contributions which are not like in these factorized or, or cascading uh, channel, but there are actually a, a process, the trident process, which uh, uh, also has contributions from a, uh, an off-hell intermediate photon, which means the photon itself stays virtual and interacts with the laser field, which is not like in a in a way because it's a quantum quantum process, which is not like a like a like a time you have in there, but it's actually producing the whole thing in one chunk. So this is like uh, the contribution, and this has uh, like several uh, implications on the dynamics. If you involve that, but I need to say this cascading one, like doing Compton and then bright reload, is part of that. So it's included in the process. But overall, the trident process has like all the benefits we want uh, from there. We have like the positron in the final state, because it's produced here in the, in the upper vertex is an electron positron pair, which we can use as a trigger particle. Uh, it is a threshold process, which will have, as is well, I've shown two slides, uh, will have implications on the interpretation of a certain distribution. Um, so called sub threshold effect as a, as a spoiler. Uh, it is a two vertex process, which means that uh, what I said, like you have a lot of dynamics due to the uh, presence of an intermediate photon. Um, for instance, it can be off shell, it can be on shell. A lot of energy can be gathered from the compound part. A lot of energy can be gathered from the from the bright wheeler part, and so on. Um, and what most uh, uh, importantly for for the European XFL, you don't need MEV photons for that to to, to ignite the process to to initialize the process, but you can gather the energy from an electron beam. And um, the thing is, uh, or what I, what I want to show you now is what, how, how much energy we need for the electrons to actually make the process happen. And for that, I have here like the, the kinematic map, like a kinematic landscape of the trident process uh, at the European XFL and others. What you see here is like the center of momentum energy of an electron laser collision again, but now it's squared, just to, to scale. Um, and for different uh, energies of the, of the uh, electron beam uh, and different frequencies of the, uh, of, the, of the used laser, I just plot uh, some lines in there. And some upcoming or, or some, some facilities which are around uh, in, this, in this regime. And as you see, if you, if you go to optical lasers like here, uh, and experiments like LAXI or this these Slack experiment, uh, this, this, this first one about this topic, you see that they are like far below the threshold of Trident. So it means in order to see some signal from Trident, they need to gather a lot of photons from the laser field. So it's usually the optical uh, sense that you uh, yeah, use these, these uh, multi-photon and non photon effects to actually get to the, to the threshold. However, if you go to uh, like x energies uh, or like secondary sources with similar uh, photon energies uh, for LLS and SLS, SLS, you see that you need less and less energy from the electron, uh, uh, less and less energy for the electron beam, and you can reach actually more easily the threshold of triad. Um, and especially for the hybrid facility, which is uh, like built in uh, GU and XFL, um, you see that you need in this plot here like roughly 50 MeV. And if you go with a with a uh, 50 MeV electron beam, but if you go with the upgrade from the European XFL up to 50 GeV, it is like five MeV electrons. And just to give you like an, an, an 
kind of imagination what, what it means to have five MeV electrons. They are actually industrial guns uh, uh, produced. Capital uh, M. Capital M. This is the important part. I, I told you in the Mac meeting, yeah. uh, this mega electron volts. It's a million electron volts. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, in industry, there are electron guns produced, which are like kind of affordable uh, with uh, five MeV. If they are have properties which can be used here, uh, it needs to be evaluated. But in the end, it could also be used like a laser wakefield accelerator, especially this uh, stable para, uh, kilohertz mill, uh, millijoule uh, accelerator, uh, where Faraday recent, more, more or less recently uh, demonstrated that they, they produce like a steady, stable stream of uh, round about 5 MeV uh, uh, electron beams. And if you use, for instance, the Redex laser at a high bef and you shoot it on a thin target, the equivalent motion of the electrons is in this order, uh, uh, order of magnitude of the electron energy. And this is like really important because when you shoot with a X file on that, which is one of the experiments at high bef, then you will see something like that just, just due to the kinematics involved. Okay. But so this means from the kinematic perspective, Trident is reachable at the uh, European XFL with reasonable uh, uh, ener energetic uh, electron beams. So the question is what should, what, what should we expect what we can see there? Um, First of all, I told you Trident is a threshold process. You produce a pair there, and the threshold is at uh, three electron masses because you have three particles with an electron mass in the final state. Um, and what you see here is the total cross section. But if you don't know, so the cross section is something like a probability measure that the process will happen at a given initial energy. So, uh, and as you see, beyond that, these black dots here are the uh, monochromatic standard QED way to calculate Trident in the lowest order. Means that uh, below three electron masses, there's nothing, no signal. However, if I switch on spectrum, like again in the pulse productive way, remember A not is small, so A not expansion of the trident process, so I can use the lowest order and involve the, uh, the spectrum again. And as you, as you see here, this has a rather huge impact on the total cross section of trident. Because when I go slightly below the threshold, I see a signal which is fairly co uh, comparable to the signal uh, uh, closely over uh, uh, a basket threshold. And this means when I go in an experiment, what I could do is I could go up above the threshold, measure Trident, demonstrate that it's there, and then go slightly below the threshold and see all the effects from the spectrum because the, 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 the standard monochromatic QED Trident is switched off by nature in a way. <laughs> So, and just to show you what you can expect, uh, like on the numbers in there, when you have a raw estimate, when you look at, I don't know, five, five uh, uh, 10 to the minus five millibarn, uh, which is like kind of here, yeah, rather here, um, um, and one nanocolumn of an electron beam, this is a bit harsh, but it's doable, I, I, they, they promised to me. Uh, and you focus your, your XFL as on, on one micron, then you can expect 6,000 positrons per, per pulse shot, uh, so per pulse cover with the electron beam. Uh, this is like, uh, uh, like a huge, it's like a lot. <laughs> and this can actually cut around in all the detectors you see there. And so it's really important to involve this in any kind of experiment which goes in this regime. So. Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, that's for my curiosity. And yeah. also, it's a very easy question. Actually, as far as, uh, I know uh, about the critical laser. Uh, the input is uh, uh, electron beam mm -hmm. and a laser. Uh, output also is laser, uh, and uh, in between uh, there is a magnetic field that uh, so-called wiggler. Yeah, wiggler or undulator. So uh, yes, wiggler, uh, planar or uh, yes. Horizontal. Yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, I forgot. <laughs> so uh, we can uh, change the wavelengths of the uh, output with uh, uh, adjusting the energy of electrons and uh, the wavelengths of the laser input laser. So right. is this right? <laughs> It was because I, I think I think the energy or the frequency of the extra laser beam is due to the undulate, not due to the energy of the electron beam, uh -huh. isn't it? Uh, 
Or lead down there is slim, slim, slim. Remember the energy, the wavelengths of the yeah, yeah, yeah. is related to the energy of the electrons. Yeah, okay. yeah. So now I cannot connect this information with what you are doing. Uh, the thing is, what you said was um, um, the thing is, what you said is, is, is completely right. But in the beginning, when I showed the slide from the Eupen XFL, I actually said that I don't want to introduce that, but I want to use the properties of the Eupen XFL in like like downstream. So, so how the laser light is produced is actually does for this kind of physics not matter. It's just uh, the, the the unique properties which comes with that, like high intensity, uh, uh, like like high frequency, like really controlled coherent light. Narrow bandwidth and so on. These are like the properties I want, and uh, that it's actually pulsed uh, because this has also some implications, as you see here. Uh, and all of these things together uh, is only reachable and only only usable at the European XFL. That's why we go to this one. That's why we go, don't go to any other facility, but it's only only there. So and. How the red line is actually produced does not matter for this kind of thing. For me, the light comes from the left, you know. Um, but it is good to know that there are some techniques and some technology behind that to actually produce the light. For this, it does not matter. It just gives the unique properties of the European XFL. This, and vice versa. These processes can help understand the European XFL. Because as you see here, the, this process is very sensitive to any kind of spectral broadening of the laser light. That means even if you have go to some optics optics with the European XFL, you can use this process to actually do diagnostics on that afterwards to see if there is any spectral broadening, any aberration, and so on. Because this is just a total cross section that's integrated. So it means you also have the information over all the other particle kinematics coming out of the process. And from there, you can infer a lot of quantities, um, like for diagnostics of the European XFL or for like light, light which got some paths in there. Uh, which which uh, changes the spectrum of it in a way. So this is like what we, what we want to do with these things. But if it's done by an like undulator or if it's done by a superconducting undulator, that's not matter for this particular case here. Thank you. 45 minutes. Right here. <laughs> and with that, I come to my last part, uh, which is, uh, I, I promise it's the last time I show this, this, this pictogram. <laughs> the thing is, um, with the with the theory, we want to we have these 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 cross sections. We have these like descriptions in a, a more or less semi analytical way. So it's just like putting it into uh, into software to actually to the integration and stuff like that. And this is usually a curve. It's usually just a plot. Uh, however, nature does not work like this. Uh, in nature, things are sampled. When I do an experiment, I sample nature in a way. What comes out of an experiment is actually a histogram. It's a, it's a number of ticks per pixel. And this is actually why I'm bringing this, this, this pictogram again. The question is how, how many times I will hear this click in this one pixel there if I do a certain process or I do a collection of processes. And what you want to do is not translating this histogram from the experiment to, uh, to theory, because the theory makes more assumptions than, than the experiment, but you want to translate the theory more in the direction of uh, the experiment, which means you want to sample your theory and producing a data structure, so histograms, in the end, uh, uh, in the same way as the uh, experiment gets these, these things from, the, from, from nature. And the reason why this is important for this type of, of, of experiments with the European XFL um, is the European XFL works like a particle physics machine. So it works like a an, like an linear accelerator for photons. Uh, but what I, what I showed you like a couple of times. And therefore, we go to the particle physicists because they do like these things all the time. And with that, uh, you have these particle physics like uh, simulation workflow. As I told you, the differential cross section coming from the theory. And from here, we need to translate them in histograms. This is actually what I will show you in the next couple of slides. And then afterwards, you can do like, or you can involve in the Monte Carlo event generation, you can involve certain properties which are like like tightly bound to the experiment for instance like showing clustering when your particles go to some matter some air or some detector parts uh, you can uh, have transport uh, through, through, through the materials you have a full detector simulation maybe so that you say okay i i, I simulate my whole detector to actually predict as as uh, precise as possible the 
the, 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 the signal seen by the experiment. Because then I can actually use this kind of data I, put, I generate there to reconstruct events coming from the detector. Reconstructing means that when I see a certain signal and a certain data point in the experiment, I can actually trace back to the origin in the theory. This is actually what, what, what you want to do in the end. And at the LHC and the particle physics experiments, they do it exactly like this. They actually trace back every data point they gathered from the experiment, every important one, uh, and trace it back till uh, like the, the very first term in the Lagrangian annuity, if you want. And this is like far future doing the whole thing, because most of the time uh, these showering things are not, uh, these gray boxes here are not in present. And the data is not ready for that. <laughs> However, as I told you, the European XFL is a machine which will bring this amount of data and will bring this kind of, of uh, precision. And we want to find some really rare processes in there, not to just a try them process. This is a more like likely process for in this in the sense. But when you go to even more obscure stuff, like obscure is a hard word, but uh, even more more uh, like like um, stuff like like photon photon scattering, like vacuum biofringence, where you have like one flip in uh, 20, 10 to 20 uh, photons or so. Finding such a thing is, it is really important to understand first all the background and to understand actually the trace from the event you see in the data point back to the theory. So, and for that, we start uh, implementing last, last year mostly uh, an event generator for uh, strong field processes, especially for the European XFR. Um, and just to give you like a like a quick overview, I don't want to go into detail for all of them. Quick overview: What kind of computing tasks come in addition to doing the modeling, as I showed you with the trident and bright field and so on? Uh, because this is just the first column, just gathering the matrix elements, doing all the matrix multiplications, and uh, solving the phase integrals, which are oscillatory, having this diagram structure. This is just the theory side. This is one part of it. Second part of it is the total cross section, which is like the integration of the whole thing uh, over the phase space, over all possible uh, uh, and physical uh, form momentum combinations. Uh, and this you, you do, since these integrals are high dimensional, usually do that with Monte Carlo integration. And since the integrand is most of the time uh, very feature rich, so you have mostly flat, mostly zero, and at some point you have really sharp peaks. Uh, and this means you need like a good adaption algorithm to actually adopt to these, uh, uh, your integration region to these, um, to these peaks. And at some point you need also kind of a mathematical optimization in there uh, because you need to find like uh, maxima uh, of, of uh, certain distributions to make the third part a bit more efficient. And this is the actual event generation. What you want to do there is you want to sample from a given this, uh, 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 probability distribution from a given PDF, which is a multi-rarity PDF, because the sample itself is a tuple or is a, is, is a, are the, the four momentum components of the scattered particles. Um, and this sampling should be fast, because in the experiment, I told you, we expect a lot of data coming in, and we want to compare that by the sheer size data, uh, we want to yeah, generate at least as much data with, with our event generator. And this means the whole thing needs to be fast, so it needs to be efficient. And the most important part from my side is um, you don't need to want to have false positives, which means when you when you go to infinite or to really large number of samples, you always want to reproduce the PDF exactly. So not with Markov chain Monte Carlo, uh, like approximately, or having some numerical bias or due to the certain method you use. I will show you it in two slides what I mean with that, uh, but we need to be sure by construct, uh, construction, that we never have any bias coming from the algorithm. This is the most important part. Okay, um, just to give you like a quick quick hint how, how it looks like because the, the time is running. Uh, the total cross section itself here for Klein Machina uh, is just like sampled in a Monte Carlo way. So you have like uniform or randomly distributed numbers. Uh, you evaluate the differential cross section on that uh, and you sum over it and normalize it. This is just it's just plain Monte Carlo. Uh, the, the fun part comes when you like redistribute your random numbers at a certain distribution, because then uh, like where the integrand is small, less points will flow in. Uh, where the integral uh, integrand has some some peaks, uh, more points will be thrown in. Uh, and this can be seen, for instance, here with this like small adapted grid, uh, which is uh, using the Vegas algorithm. It's just an algorithm to to do iteratively adopt uh, to certain features of, of our integrand. 
Um, but this is just the first part because you use this adaptive, adaptive grid, so it's called adaptive grid, to make actually the second part of it more efficient. I don't uh, use it here because the second part is so-called unweighting or sample drawing. Because when you just use the adaptive grid here and sample the whole thing, you will add a bias, a bias from the adaptation. Um, and what, you, what, we, what we actually do to unbias this one or to unweight this one, to so make all the weights one, uh, is we use heterogeneous sampling, so acceptance rejection. So what we do actually is we throw uh, uh, and, and or we draw another uniform uh, uh, distributed random number and just check if our point get a or sample is uh, above or below uh, uh, the, the curve given by the PDF. So we translate the weights in a way to probabilities and just check if the probability is in the PDF or is produced by the PDF in a way. Uh, and this means all the red points here are rejected and all the blue points are accepted. And if you then do a histogram of all the blue points uh, or the, 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 the arguments of the blue points, uh, you will end up reproducing the PDF. Exactly. So just can you, can you prove that the exact reproduction? Uh, reproduction. And now I show you how we how we actually did this kind of thing with the processes I showed you here for common uh, for common scattering again. Uh, we used again pass for the QD in lowest order, so it's just the A not contribution. Uh, but we had the field involved. This is the important part. We use 40 kV for the for the laser, and we just uh, assume just certain uh, a part of profile. So this is like the the the, the envelope shape uh, which which is put it over the the uh, laser field. So it's a cosine square part. And what you see here is just a screenshot out of uh, our program, uh, which gives you a data frame. Uh, where you, and then the reason why I show you that is when we generate these events, we have all, all uh, four momentum components in present. So there is no approximation on the, on the, on the kinematics in a way, um, which means that in the end, we can, every kinematical axis, we can transform our whole data. So if I want to have, for instance, here the first column is the actual photo number parameter, the L, I can actually calculate that. And this can be calculated from all the other component, components. This is one of the axes where you can get. Um, and what I did uh, is actually uh, transforming the whole data to the scattering angle and the energy of the photo, uh, scattered photons again. And then I did just a 2D histogram of these uh, 1 million samples I, I uh, actually generated there. And as you see, it's a similar to the, to the one that I showed you in the very beginning. It's around the Kleinerschina line, just the broadening of the line. Fairly good. It means our uh, event generator might work. But the thing is, we want to verify it. And the reason uh, why I showed you the pulse the profile is, if you remember in the lowest order of uh, a not expansion of, of component scattering in the beginning, very beginning, there was this Fourier transformer of the background field order, amplitude of the background field. And this is actually, you can, you can uh, this end up being like the Fourier transform of our pulse profile. And the pulse profile is a cosine square, means I can analytically calculate the F of L. So the distribution of all the L. And as I told you, I can transform the whole data to the L axis, to the photon number parameter. This is what I did on the right hand side. So I just projected everything uh, I generated on the, on the uh, L axis, and I uh, put as a, as a distribution, which I expect for L, uh, 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 analytically on that. I need to put a fudge factor on that because this L is actually uh, uh, it's, it's two dimensional, and I projected everything on one dimension, but it's fact, fudge factor is constant. So, and afterwards, I can compare with a histogram against the analytical solution of the distribution of a certain, certain kinematical component of, of the process. And as you see, it is like uh, we are reproducing what I expect. And if I use like smaller bins, it is more or less exact, which it should be because I use hit or miss, which has no bias. So it should reproduce the thing if, you, if I do these things. And even if I go to really like wide pulses, which means the pulse becomes more and more monochromatic, uh, then I have just like shrinking together to the to the to the Panishina line. And even that I can sample. And even that uh, shows that the small spectrum on the on the, on the uh, photon number parameter is reproduced by the histogram. So I, I can even uh, we can even reproduce this one. But there's one thing which is which is like a problem with this whole thing. Uh, you actually produce one million events in this case here with a wider, uh, with a smaller pulse, means your wider spectrum. It takes um, yeah, a couple of milliseconds 
to, to produce this one. Uh, it's fairly good. This one here takes a couple of minutes. And the reason is, uh, if you remember, if uh, my integrand or my distribution is very feature rich, so it's flat everywhere, and at some distinct points, like here on this line, it is like really high. Then I need to adopt. And this adoption, with, with this adoption, the acceptance rate is good or not. And the problem is, this one is really hard to adopt. So um, this means here I have a lot of rejected events. Just to give a number on that, here I reject around about 30 to 40 percent of the events after adoption. Here, 99.5-99.6 percent are rejected. So under one percent of the events can be taken. Um, this is why it takes so long. It is a sign kind of important sampling. This is important topic. sampling. Yeah, yeah. Vegas, Vegas is important sampling. It is important sampling where the where the uh, dominant part in important sampling or the yeah, like transformation part is uh, uh, approximate uh, approximate by a learning uh, algorithm where you put iteratively learn uh, with a step function uh, the, the uh, like transformation to a more better one. But I will show you in this slide <laughs> why this is not always a good idea. And for that, uh, I come to the work of my student Tom, which is also here, um, where. Uh, this is just one of the, of the things we did there. Uh, it is a, is a double Gauss in two dimensions. So it's just two dimensions and you have two Gauss blocks there. Uh, and what we want to do is we want to uh, draw samples from this distribution. And here in the second thing, uh, it is like the, the adoption, adop the, uh, uh, the adaptive grid coming from Vegas. So Vegas just like throws points on it and then it evaluates the thing. And then due to the evaluation of the values of the function, it adopts the grid. Uh, to to the certain features. However, by construction in Vegas, it adopts only aligned with the call in the axis, which means that it projects all the things to one axis, does an evaluation there, adopts there, it does it for the next axis, and adopts there. This is what you actually see here. That's why these lines are always like parallel to a coordinate line. However, you see that the adoption at the, the peaks are fairly good, but it introduces here and here additional adoption. And when I use this adaptive grid uh, to, to, to produce a, a proposal for my hit or miss, it actually shows two peaks here, which are not present in the ground truth. And these are called ghost peaks. And ghost peaks are like rather bad because in a hit or miss sampler, this thing, these two will actually be thrown away mostly. And this means uh, I have like a, like a natural limit of, uh, of, accept, of my acceptance rate due to these ghost peaks. And as I showed you for the, for the content scattering, it's, it's just a line in this off diagonal part. Vegas kind of adopt to that. And uh, a new idea which come, uh, was, was uh, invented in 2019 and brought to these scattering processes, I think last year, 21, I don't know. Um, the book from paper was 21. 2020, okay. Uh, but in the recent years, there was like a, 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 a machine learning uh, method to actually improve this kind of, of uh, adoption by learning due to these called coupling layers, uh, learning uh, the, uh, the PDF as a histogram. And this can be used as a new uh, machine to uh, for, for proposal, which then can be used in hit or miss. Some people use it directly as a sampler, but this thing is biased. <laughs> so and this is what I don't want. Uh, that's why we do hit or miss afterwards uh, again. But as you see, like just for this uh, particular example here, it adopts very well. So this is a sample produced uh, uh, from, from our ground truth. And this does not show uh, the um, ghost peaks. And with that, I come to my summary. Um, I introduced you to, you to like the machine, like the European uh, It's a high energy, meaning high frequency. It has high intensity. Uh, and it has a high repetition rate. Um, and this, these are like unique properties coming together with the Phoenix FPL. Uh, and as I showed you, uh, what you can do there is some kind of QED processes, but in pulse bottom of QED, which means you involve like the spectrum of the laser field. Uh, and there, I showed you something about uh, Compton scattering, white wheel of pipe production and trident process, why they are uh, important, why they are good or why not. Uh, and in the end, I showed you something about Monte Carlo wind generation um, and I want to leave you with uh, with a sentence on a particle physics machine. You should, uh, you need to do also particle physics experiments. And with that, ah, again, it's my thing. <laughs> I just lied to you. Uh, with that, I uh, yeah, thank my collaborators and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. What is
great talk and nice overview of uh, European XFL and <laughs> strong futurity. Um, let's see, we had some questions already. During the talk, uh, are there more questions, further questions? Uh, so, what is the difference between Vegas and important sampling? Is Vegas just a way of... Uh, yeah, that's just a way. Important sampling is like general concept yeah, yeah. of variance reduction, right. and Vegas is one way to, uh, to, to implement that. And not implement, but one way to, to uh, gather the uh, like dominant part. Mm -hmm. It's just one way, one algorithm to gather, to gather that. But it's a universal one because important sampling usually assumes you know what is the dominant part of your integral. And Vega is one universal way to do that. And so, do you have any intuition on why it's creating the coast peaks? This, it, it actually, you can actually directly see because Vegas actually, uh, by construction, Vegas adopts only a line to the coordinate axis. Okay. As it means when I, when I just look at the uh, x axis here, and I adopt there, I see this adoption lines here. Tip, 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 tip. And here again, tip, 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 tip. Yeah. The same for the, for the y axis. And when I just use this, you see also here, there are like smaller bins. Okay. Which means there is an adoption even if there is no, no signal there. Just by, by incident. So it's, it's, it's incidental. And when I just use this grid, it's not this, but uh, when I, even, even if I go with thousands of bins, even then I introduce these, these ghost peaks here. Because it always like adopts a line to the column that makes it. And then you get this additional structure. And this becomes even more, yeah, more a problem if you have more peaks. Another question, yeah. um, more general. Yeah. So you had shown the small parameter A0. I forgot what it was called. Uh, uh, classical nonlinearity parameter. And you said a European exit field has one value, something like 10 to a negative three of its parameter. Um, is that fixed or can, if you change the properties, in the end, if you change the properties of the of the electron beam, you could change that parameter? No, no. no. Uh, because, uh, actually, no. Because the thing is, um, the quantity itself uh, is uh, Lone's invariant. So uh, what you what you and it was calculated with the with the electron at rest. This is also the the the, the frame where the intensity is measured and the frequency of the uh, European XFL is measured. These are the two quantities going in there, and they are combined in a way that the combination is Lorentz invariant. Which means in every other frame, for instance, in the frame of a moving electron beam, it has the same value. Hmm. So it means you 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 just calculate it once. Uh, and uh, uh, it is in every frame the same. Mm -hmm. However, uh, if you change the frequency, maybe from 13 keV currently present to 50 keV, it changes the a lot. And I think to the worst because it becomes small. Mm -hmm. uh, or when you go from, from 10 to the 21, uh, uh, um, what's per square centimeter for the intensity to maybe 10 to, 10 to 22 or 23, then it increases. But this is like, this is the only, only thing which influences the a lot. Mm -hmm. And then related to this, mm -hmm. the process you um, explained, like Trident, mm -hmm. um, are these processes that need a larger A0 to be observed? Or what, would there be, because you said you could, in principle, um, include higher order terms, um, would there be specific processes that you could then simulate and observe? Uh, the, the thing, the thing is, um, when you have like a threshold process like Trident, um, the the threshold itself, even if you call it sub threshold effects, the threshold itself is a physical property of nature. So it means that that you need to reach uh, uh, this, or you need to yeah reach this threshold to make the process happen. Where you get this energy from depends on what you what you want to or what is the setup in your experiment. If you have a small a knot, you need the energy maybe from the electron beam, maybe from the high frequency of the laser. If you have a big A0, you can gather the energy by absorbing more and more photons. And the reason why this is more likely for high A0 is every photon score, every photon uh, you, uh, which you additionally couple, couple on is scaled in the whole process by A0 squared, at least for the perturbative when A0 is near to one, which means in the small A0 region, these multi-photon effects become more and more le uh, uh, less and less likely, because every time with a factor of uh, a naught square. But when you're in the high uh, uh, a naught uh, region, it's a non-perturbative effect, 
you actually gather the thing from a, like a blob of photons. And then you can uh, make the process uh, also happen. The bigger issue here is that um, the um, high end node stuff is really hard to calculate, especially for Trident. Um, for the small end nodes, it's too, but uh, there, there are other problems for the high end node, especially these highly oscillatory integrals. These are like, like a real mess. So, so it's really hard to get, get actually the numbers out of it. Um, and the dynamics is completely different. So this is what you also see for similar uh, for simple processes like Compton or so. You see that a not bigger than one is completely qualitatively different from a not smaller than one. And here, this was just uh, applied to the European XFL. And yeah, luckily, uh, a not is rather small, so we can predict. As I showed you in the beginning, it needs to be done. So it, it was not done because most of people treat the European XFL as a huge optical laser, which is which is not. So this is why why we need to do these kind of um, timelines for success. Uh, I, I plan to have the uh, no, successful watches. The question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So to have uh, yeah experiment and theory. Uh, this this is hard to say. Uh, I, I need. To, uh, I work closely together okay. with uh, both from from Ibet, uh, uh, especially uh, like Tom Cohen and so on. Yeah? Um, and. What they do is they actually get a data now in this in this time. We have priority, they have prior, priority beam line uh, beam times for that and, and so on, especially for these kinds of processes. When or on the time having the electron beam present, no one knows. Uh, when we what we actually need is not the electron beam. The electron is not a problem. The uh, problem is getting the detector. So you need a good detector to actually measure these kind of things. And I think the first detector will be a shitty detector, as usual, and we need to see if we can predict something there. However, I think the experiment is like a bit uh, far uh, ahead of the uh, theory because we don't have like a good event generator present uh, yet. Uh, we have some prototype, my, my prototype, for instance. Um, however, this this has a time scale till I would say in summer this year to have like a, at least involved uh, common right we learn Trident up to a certain uh, extent, and then we can do like a bigger theory stuff. So so using like real uh, real like Boltzmann distributed electrons and scatter with the laser and so on and so on. So this is what we can what we can do what we expect this year. Do you think of testing your event generator also in other experiments? I mean, is Slack still doing such physics? Yes, the problem is that uh, as I said, we need uh, like fast sample uh, sample drawing and uh, these experiments like with Slack and so on uh, usually use optic lasers. And this is really, really hard to model with an event generator. Um, so we could do that maybe for SLS. Uh, so we have these these X-ray lasers uh, because A not small, and then we can write sorry write the model in a way that we that we can draw the samples fast. Um, but eventually, in a midterm, I would say uh, we also need to involve the the optical lasers as well, and we want to do that. And there were some ideas, but uh, yeah, we are just a finite number of people. So. <laughs> Any more questions? I will check the online audience. Little question: Do you also you mentioned also this um, graphene, so the semi metals? Yes. Yeah. Ideas, or is there also know, some, it's, it's, some need? No, no, no. no. Uh, Dresden has uh, so Max Planck Institute is. The, yes, yes, yes. Uh, 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 this is actually for me is just, just an motivation for now. So I only want to live in this field. Um, however, I talk with uh, some some people, uh, especially from from Bad Schützold, who yeah. do this graphene stuff, um, and yeah, look into the, the community, and they actually start doing experiments with it in this regime and yeah. this this uh, thing. Um, however, for me, as I said, we are not a finite number of people, uh, uh, but in the, the future, it is definitely something uh, which we, we want to look at yeah. because this is actually. Yeah, when you have something like an image generator in present, you can uh, do like really, really good, nice experiments with that, even with the pin. So, good. Cool. All right. Doesn't look like there are more questions. Then thanks again, Uwe.